Welcome to today's program. My guest is Glenn Scrivener, a creative apologist. Glenn, welcome to Facing the Canon. Thanks so much for having me. I love having a creative evangelist on the program, <laughs> and uh, I know this will be a fascinating conversation. So, where do you originate from? Uh, Canberra in Australia, which is not the most exciting or rock and roll place in the world. It's where all the politicians are and the civil servants in Australia, but I lived there until I was 14. And then, give or take the odd deportation, I've mainly been in the UK for the last half of my life. Now, is it Anne Forbes? Ah, yes, you know Ten, about Anne Forbes. Anne Forbes, tell okay. us about her. <laughs> she is my great, 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 great grandmother who stole 10 uh, yards of cotton from a London market. She was sentenced to death, obviously, for her heinous crime. And uh, uh, yeah, she was to be uh, hanged by the neck until dead. But her sentence was commuted from uh, death to life transportation to Australia, which was considered a fate worse than death uh, at the time. But uh, I always joke, she did pretty well out of the whole caper. I mean, she left the set of Oliver Twist, she wound up on the set of Home and Away. It's, uh, who says crime doesn't pay, you know? So she, uh, you know, they, they basically commuted her sentence because they had 1,700 men that they were gonna transport to Australia and only 300 women. And if you're gonna colonize a, a country, uh, that's probably not a good ratio. And uh, so a lot of, a lot of uh, women started to be transported as well. And then she met and married Thomas Huxley, whose crime was uh, riding his master's horse without his permission. So, joy riding, basically. So he got moved to Australia. He, he sailed out on the third fleet, Anne Forbes was out on the first fleet, and once they'd done their 14 years of hard labor, uh, they were given a plot of land just north of Sydney, and uh, they married and uh, they became quite prosperous farmers. In fact, there's a, a bridge north of Sydney called Tom Ugly's Bridge, which is named after my ancestor, Thomas Huxley. <laughs> And the story the family tells is that he's called Tom Ugly because the natives couldn't pronounce Huxley and so they just said Ugly, but there are other theories for, for why he might have been of called course. Tom Ugly. Yeah. Wow, so fascinating historical heritage. <laughs> yeah. It's a skeleton in the closet for anyone else, but for Australians it's a, it's a badge of honour. It's yeah. a great story. <laughs> uh, growing up, Glenn, were you a person of faith? Were your family? Yeah, we were a church going home, um, but I, I always sort of think, my vision of God growing up was that God was pretty much like electricity. You know, I, I didn't know much about electricity. I didn't know much about God. Electricity is very powerful. God's very powerful. If you get on the right side of God, you can harness his energy. And if you get on the wrong side, zap. That was pretty much my vision of, of God. And so there was something massively lacking, and that was Jesus, you know, the person of Jesus. And it was really only towards the end of university that a friend of mine, he kept inviting me to church and I went along just to hate the preacher. And um, every Sunday, he, he thought he was so clever. He, he was you know, giving all these illustrations based on popular culture. And I thought, you, you think you're so down with the kids and you're not. And I would go back again the following Sunday. And then the So there was something Sunday. very appealing. Yeah, and this... there was a praying mother in the background. You a know, praying mother? Two decades of a praying mother is hard to fight against. And then my friend said, let's have a look at the gospels. And I remember thinking, I, I got halfway through Luke's gospel and I just thought Jesus, his towering personality, his stooping love, if God is, if God's like Jesus, I'm in. And that was really where it all changed. At a particular moment, at a particular meeting? It's funny that there are a series of different moments. Um, the, the theologian Jonathan Edwards always says we tend to late date our conversions and his point was that we always want to give ourselves more credit for the spiritual insight we had as unbelievers. So we, we sort of look back to our Christian history and we think, well, I had these thoughts about God, but I wasn't yet born again. I had this spiritual experience of God, but I didn't yet have the spirit. Um, and I think Jonathan Edwards would say, if you had those experiences of God and you felt that way about Jesus, probably the spirit was at work a little bit earlier than than you think you were. So I don't know where to, where to date my conversion from. I, I very clearly remember meeting Jesus in Luke's gospel. I very clearly remember it being uh, a, a sense of the immediate presence of Jesus who was Lord and demanded to be known as Lord. You know, I, I know John Piper sort of talks about 
Uh, you look at the sun and you know that it's bright. You taste honey, you know that it's sweet. You look at Jesus in the scriptures and you, you just know that he's Lord. I, I distinctly remember reading of him in my room in Oxford. I also distinctly remember a few months later, I was back in Australia and it was the millennium and uh, we were at Sydney Harbour. I was there with a friend who was uh, going to the church that I'd sort of thrown myself into. And uh, in Sydney Harbour, across the Sydney Harbour Bridge, they had eternity written in this, this font because of the, the famous evangelist, I forget his name, uh, Arthur Stace. Yes. Who with chalk, he only knew one word. He was illiterate, except for he knew the word eternity and he would write eternity on the pavements of, of Sydney. They reckon he might have written it a, a million times on the pavements of, of Sydney. And in a very secular country, in a very secular city, they decided to honor Arthur Stace by writing his word across the Sydney Harbour Bridge on the 2000th birthday of Jesus and eternity. And I remember as that lights up with the fireworks, my friend next to me says, Jesus is eternity. And I was like, Jesus is eternity. <laughs> I was like, I, I was definitely converted by then. Yes, there yeah. was something real. Yeah. And it obviously transformed your life yeah. and uh, transformed your journey of life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think, you know, Jesus said in, in Matthew 12, verse 34, uh, from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And I think whatever, whatever grips your heart wags your tongue. And that, that was certainly the case for me and Jesus. You became a, a minister, worked in various churches. Mm -hmm. What, how would you describe what you do now? Mm. I'm an evangelist. I, I lead a ministry called Speak Life. And uh, we do three things, really. We, we proclaim Christ in person. We proclaim Christ through media. And we train others to do the same. And, and if people are interested in creative communication of Jesus to the, the, to the unbelieving world, then uh, Speak Life is, is a place where we really want to forge evangelists and evangelistic resources together. How would you explain simply, Glenn, what is the gospel? Mm. I often talk about uh, in, in terms of light, life and love. You know, in the beginning there was light, life and love. There's always been a father loving his son in the joy of the spirit. And that explains why the, the greatest things in life are light, life and love. We've come from love, we've been shaped by love. We are intended for love, but then we look at the world and the world is not like that. It's full of darkness and death and disconnection. And you think, where has that come from? Well, the Bible says we've turned from the light. And if you turn from light, you end up in darkness. If you turn from life, you end up in death. If you turn from love, then you end up in disconnection, all the ways that love goes wrong. So here we are in this pit of death and darkness and disconnection. What does the God of love do? Well, love enters in. And so the God of love in Christ has come down. He's the son of the father, full of the spirit to join us in the darkness, to take that darkness on himself on the cross, to take that death on himself on the cross, to even take that hellish disconnection from God on himself on that cross. He did it all for love, took it down to the hell that it deserves and rose up again. And he says, you in the darkness, do you want my light? You in disconnection, do you want my love? You in death, do you want my life? And anyone who turns to Jesus and says yes to him, they get Jesus as their very own Lord. They get his father as their father, his spirit as their spirit, his future as their future. It's good news. It is absolute good news. Mm. What would you say to any of our viewers and listeners, mm. Glenn, who haven't yet made that decision to receive Christ, surrender to Christ as Lord? What would you say to them? It is the absolute best decision in the world, isn't it? So, so John chapter 10, verse 10 says, the thief has come to steal and kill and destroy. He's speaking about Satan. There is spiritual evil in this world that wants to take from you and to, to deform light, life and love into death, darkness and disconnection. And there's no future in that. The thief comes to steal, kill and destroy. I have come that you might have life and have it in all its fullness. And so Jesus, Jesus calls us to come now to experience a life that begins right now. Why would you put it off? You can have that life that starts now and will stretch on forever. It's free and it's forever and it's for you. If any of our viewers, listeners would like to say, yes, I want that, would you lead them in a prayer, Glenn? Oh, Father, I uh, pray for my friends who are hearing of this and their hearts are yearning for your life, for your love, for your light. And they've been stirred by your spirit now and perhaps they're feeling the way they're feeling now because you are at work. You're awakening them to their longing. You're awakening them to Jesus. And I, I pray, Father, 
Would you open their eyes to Jesus? May they see him as brighter than the sun, sweeter than honey. May they see him as Lord. And I pray that my friends would right now open their hearts and say, Jesus, come in. Jesus, I want you. Father, I turn from my darkness. I want your light. I turn from my disconnection. I want your love. I turn from all the things that lead to death. Give me your life. Give me your spirit. Walk with me now through this life and into your eternity. Amen. Amen. If you echoed that prayer that Glenn prayed, we pray that you would know Jesus' cleansing, his healing, and his peace and his presence. And can we encourage you to read the Bible? Start with the Gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament about the life and the teaching of Jesus Christ. And can we encourage you to find a local, vibrant church uh, where you can grow in your faith? Glenn, I, I do love the way that you creatively endeavor to communicate uh, the gospel. And you, you do that in many different ways hmm. and very visual often. Mm, mm. Uh, tell us some of your projects that you've created in recent years. Mm. Well, I, I love thinking visually about the gospel. I, th I think it's something I naturally gravitate to. So for instance, I, I think of a, an animation uh, that we've done at Easter time called Cannonball. And uh, it, it's this idea that we are sinking down into the grave. And what Jesus does is not so much pull us back up to heaven, but join us in the pits and blast a hole through death and out the other side. So I wrote a poem called Cannonball. But as I started writing the poem, it started sounding like a rap. And it's got this line, you know, uh, like a cannibal shot using lover's ammunition on a mission of collision causing catastrophic fission to our carrying coalition with morticians. And I was like, I can't pull that off. I need, I need an actual rapper. So we got Governor B to come in and uh, Josh Lucas did the music. And we created this full on music video called Cannonball. And we, we've just seen people respond to it so powerfully because it's a visual way of picturing the gospel, not as a rescue rope, that lifts us out of this world, but it's the Christ who joins us in this world to pioneer a way through death and out the other side into his future. That's just one of the many ways. We, we have seasonal videos that are at Easter and Christmas and Halloween and all sorts like that. Uh, we have weekly videos where I interview people. I'm a, I'm a poor man's J. John, so I, I try and do a facing the canon type, type thing with, with other people. Uh, we have a couple of podcasts that we release and lots of books that, again, you try to... do, yeah. and I've got some of your books okay. here. I, I mean, there are so many, honestly, I've enjoyed several of your books, mm. but I'm really intrigued by these, these little booklets, mm. Love Story and Divine Comedy. Yeah. Now, tell us what these are. I love these books. These are, these are the kind of books that you can read in an hour, you can read in a single sitting, and you give them to somebody, they're not gonna crumple that up in their hands, because first of all, physically, you can't crumple them up in your hands. And people, there's still a massive stigma attached to sort of throwing a book away. No one wants to throw a book away. And so even if people don't pick it up and read it immediately, it will sit on a shelf and stare at somebody until they perhaps do pick it up and read it. And so these, these books that can be read in a single sitting are just a way of delivering the gospel. And you can get a good hour's worth of gospel content to somebody in a place where they're sitting, they're imbibing it, they're, they're letting these ideas do, do their work on a, on a person and letting Jesus really confront them. And so Love Story, for instance, it's the story of how uh, C.S. Lewis got converted. And it was a conversation that he had with J.R.R. Tolkien. Wouldn't you have wanted to have been a, and, a oh, fly on the wall? Would have loved to have been. As Mr. Middle Earth talks to Mr. Narnia, and at that stage, Mr. Narnia, C.S. Lewis was not yet a Christian, and, and Tolkien was, and he basically said, okay, the, the Gospels are the, the myth that really happened, the true love story, and I go through basically that light, life, and love thing that I just uh, sort of ran through with you, but I, I take my time over it and, and uh, talk about the Gospel that converted C.S. Lewis, and, and maybe it could convert you. Absolutely. And then uh, Divine Comedy. What is life? Is, is life a tragedy or a comedy? A tragedy is a story that begins in joy, ends in pain. A comedy is a story that begins in pain and ends in joy. So a comedy is a smile, a tragedy is a frown. What is life? Well, life without Jesus, you might 
go up in the world, but you tumble down into death. With Jesus, down in the pit, he joins you and raises you to his life. So with Jesus, you can turn your tragedy into a comedy. Do you know, I do. What I love about these little booklets is mm. that um, they're concise, the message is clear, mm. it's very creative, and it's like seeds, sowing them right. into people's lives right. and possibly creating curiosity oh, yeah. that leads to conversation. You know, we had, we had an email from a woman in Northern Ireland. She, she um, hadn't gone to church for years and years. And she, the only reason she went, was in this church building was she was playing indoor bowls. And she saw a love story on a table. And so she just picked up love story and started to read it. And then she emails me out of the blue and she just says, there's a prayer at the end of that book. And you said to email you if you prayed that prayer. I've prayed that prayer. I love Jesus. And she, she emails me about every month and just tells me how much she's enjoying Jesus. And it's just a, a real joy. Well, it is a joy, isn't it? Mm. Helping people in their journey of faith. And that's one of the things that both of us are endeavouring to do in people's lives. Yeah. Three, two, one. Mm. What's that about? It's about life according to Jesus. And if you come to Jesus and if he is Lord to you, that means three things. It means he's what God is like. It means he's the true master of this world. He's the Lord. And it means he's my Lord. And so it's, there are truths about God, the world, and you. And so I just, I just press into what, what does it look like to view reality with Jesus at the center? What is Jesus' picture of God, Jesus' picture of the world, Jesus' picture of you? There's a threeness to God. There's a two-ness to the world, a splitness. And there's a oneness that's intended for us. And if you want to understand the, uh, the numbers, you have to read the book, I guess. A lot of people's understanding of Christianity, Glenn, mm. is a misunderstanding. Absolutely. And so many people have got, uh, are misinformed. Yes. And they have misconceptions. So in many ways, you have, we have to clear those away, don't we? Yes. Yeah. Before we present the real Jesus. Right, yeah. I say that in, in 321, I, I quote from Tom Wright, um, who after this event that I speak of, you know, became Bishop of Durham, and uh, he, he was a chaplain at uh, Worcester College, Oxford. And uh, he used to have lots of students come up to him and say, you know, don't, don't waste your breath on me, chaplain, I don't even believe in God. And for so many people, that's the end of the conversation, but not for Tom Wright. For Tom Wright, he said, oh, which God is it that you don't believe in? Yes. And they would sort of stare at their shoes, not really understanding. He's, he pressed them, you know, describe to me the God in whom you don't believe. And they would end up describing some kind of distant figure, high on personality, low on power, just kind of a Zeus figure with a thunderbolt ready to hurl. And what does Tom Wright say? I don't believe in that God either. Let me tell you about Jesus. And I think that's, that's the number one misconception. You know, I, I had a misconception that God was like electricity. And I had to have that, that misconception of who God is just completely cleared away and replaced with Jesus. And that's what repentance is. You know, the Greek word repentance literally means a change of mind. We've been viewing things all wrong. And suddenly in the face of Jesus, we are confronted with something that, oh, if God's like this, I'm in. You know, that's, that's the, the heart of conversion, I'd say. You're, you're very uh, creative, Glenn, and confident in sharing your faith about Jesus. Mm. Uh, Many of us in the church lack that confidence. Mm. What advice would you give us? I would say go deep with the good news of Jesus. I, th I think if, if it's true, and it is, that Matthew 12, verse 34, from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, if the words are drying up, then there's a heart issue. You know, I need to fill up again on Jesus. And so, in a sense, my first advice is not go and do a whole bunch of evangelism. In, in a sense, my, my first advice is fill up again. Be, be re-evangelized by Jesus. And so your advice to somebody who's just prayed that prayer for the first time is really good advice for the Christian too, isn't it? Yes. Open up Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That, that They are evangelists, you know? Yes. And how do they evangelize us? They present, they placard Jesus before our eyes again and say, look again to him, see his power, see his goodness. And I know in my own life, I, my words dry up when I don't believe either the gospel is good or powerful. I don't think it's good news, so I won't bother sharing it with you. I don't believe it's powerful, because so I don't think it'll make any difference. But if I, if I let Jesus re-evangelize me, I see his power, I see his goodness, and the words start to flow. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I, I think that I'm reminded, was it, 
of John Newton who wrote Amazing Grace. Yes. It was said of him that if you cut John Newton open, the Bible would have fallen out of him right. because his blood was bibline. Yes, right. And there yeah. is something about being filled with the gospel, yes. with the word of God, yes. with the yes. presence of Jesus, of course. Yes. And yeah. there's this overflow. Yes, it's got to be from fullness. I think too much evangelism is out of emptiness. You know, so the, the local church, you know, minister, oh, the pews are a bit empty. We need to do some evangelism. Or the, the coffers are not as full as we'd like them to be. So let's go and do some evangelism. And at that stage, your whole goal is to gain converts. And I think you can be quite manipulative at that stage, if that, if that is your motivation. But if it's from fullness, I love what the, the old evangelists Wesley and Whitfield would say back in the 1700s after a hard days of evangelism where, where they would speak to tens of thousands of people in the open air sometimes. Um, the way they would describe their evangelism is in their diaries they would say, I offered them Christ. Yes. Not I tried to gain converts. No. Out of a fullness, I've got something I want to share with you. And so it's, it's got to be not the manipulative thing of sucking in. It's got to be the overflow of a heart that's already joy-filled in Jesus. Absolutely. Your most recent book, Glenn, The Air We Breathe. Mm. Fascinating title. Mm -hmm. How did you come up with that title? So it's, it's really, I have two people in mind for that book. One of them is uh, my father-in-law, who is a great history buff. And um, uh, I wrote it to show him uh, how all of the, the things that we take for granted in the West, human rights, human equality, the sanctity of life, freedom, compassion, all these things, they actually have a Christian basis to them. And I wanted, I wanted to show him that through 2,000 years of church history, these ideas have kind of, through the gospel, embedded themselves down into some of the moral intuitions of society so that he can see a historical argument, really, for um, the resurrection. Because the historical argument for the resurrection in, in this book is not so much the history of the first century, but the history since the first century. Why have we ever heard of Jesus of Nazareth? Why did Christianity not die with Christ? Because Christianity did not die on Good Friday. Christianity somehow burst to life, and it's become the most diverse, inclusive, enduring revolution the world has ever seen, the most diverse, inclusive sociological phenomenon the world has ever seen. How do you explain that sort of explosion of growth? And it, it, in a sense, looking at Christian history such that there's the billions of people around the world who claim Jesus as Lord, how do you go from that, that God-forsaken execution to world domination? That's quite a miracle. Huge miracle. A huge miracle. You know, I mean, the first miracle in John's gospel, turning water into wine. But I would say that turning God-forsaken execution into world domination is, is even better, right? How do you account for it? And, and I wrote it also for a, another friend of mine. I'll call her Sally. And she wrote to me once and she said, um, of course, you realize, Glenn, I could never be a believer. And she has this idea that I'm constitutionally able to believe and she is constitutionally unable yes. to believe. And, and there are people like that. They think that all they the time. They think that. And yet my point with Sally is she lives by intuitions and morals and values that she can't prove. You know, she, there's, no, there's no mathematical equation that says all humans have equal human rights. There's, there's nothing scientifically that says compassion is this supreme value that we should try and, you know, these are all gut instincts, intuitions, morals, values, they're beliefs. They're not the, 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 the process of, uh, they're not the result of, of reason and evidence. And therefore, these beliefs that have come through the, the Jesus revolution are particularly Christian-ish. And if she's prepared to believe in something like human rights, which has no kind of logical foundation, then can I give her some foundations for believing in these sorts of things? And I would say only Jesus does. So that's the argument of the air we breathe. So obviously, Glenn, you're a believer, you're a Christian, you've experienced Christ in your life. But for people uncertain about faith, for people yeah. who they might say, I can't believe, yeah. what would you say to them? I would say, first of all, be attentive to the things you already do believe. Because I don't believe that anyone is an unbeliever in that ultimate sense. 
You can't really get out of bed without trusting that it's worth it. Um, you can't really navigate life with a whole bunch of strangers without kind of, you take it for granted that, that the other person who is facing you um, is not going to be a snake in the grass who's out for your harm. You've got, you've got to, it's a venture of faith. Everything you do every day is a kind of a venture of faith. When you scroll through your Facebook and, and you see, I, I love those videos. Do you ever see them on Facebook where there's like, I, I saw one on Facebook the other day. There was a, a, a kid, he was 15 years old with profound autism. He was nonverbal and he was on a basketball team and he never played in any of the games. And then in the final game of the season, they brought him on for the last five minutes. And everyone is like willing this kid on. They, 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 they want this kid to do so well. And even the opposition, you know, cottons on at the end and they're, they're handing him the ball and he sort of has a shot and it misses. And he has another shot and it misses and the whole crowd is going, come on, come on. In the end, everybody gets him up onto their shoulders and he sort of slam dunks this, this ball down and the roof is absolutely lifted. And you just think, in an ancient society, no one would understand what's going on there no. because they were dominance cultures. And, you know, if someone is unable to score a basket, don't give him the ball, you know. And yet we have this profound belief that a society is judged best that looks after its weakest members. We, we have this profound idea of kindness and compassion and mercy and lifting up those who are in difficulty and, and helping them. And we believe in that so much. It doesn't matter if you're... Christian or a Jedi Knight or an atheist or whoever whoever you are, you get those same you know goosebumps when you see that compassion. You are already a believer. You already believe in some rather Christian-ish things. And I need to take you on a longer journey to show you that it's Jesus himself that provides you the basis for those things. But I don't think it's silly to be called a believer. In fact, I think to believe in those things is like being midair, you know, with no foundation beneath your feet. And what I want to do is kind of give you a foundation for the beliefs that you already have. So come to Jesus. That's, that's the argument I kind of make. You're a very stimulating guy, <laughs> Glenn, really great. And uh, as I said earlier, um, I love the way that you think and the way that you argue and the way that you communicate and uh, pray that you'll just continue doing it mm. and um, keep coming up with more creativity to communicate this incredible good news well, that we too. have. You too, you too, Thanks, John. Thanks, for joining us. Thank you. I really hope you've enjoyed that conversation with Glenn. I hope it's inspired you. I hope it's given you a faith lift. Thank you for joining us on Facing the Canon. Please join us again. Mm -hmm.